Rob Gould, Director of Business Analytics for Facility Source, CBRE. Rob has been working in business analytics for nine years, working in SQL, Tableau, and Python. And he is presenting on how to use data to tell a story. Some background on Facility Source. Facility Source works to optimize the facility's maintenance space by using data to drive day to day decisions. Rob will be discussing how aspects of dashboard design, such as color, shape, position, and more, can influence the ability to understand data. He will dive into how to use various tools like Excel, Tableau, Click, Looker, and more for effective data storytelling. Welcome, Rob. Thank you. So today we're going to be diving into the data visualization. Uh, to give you guys a framework, data visualization is really storytelling, and storytelling is an art mixed with some science. I think it's best summed up with this quote from Stephen Few, who is one of the gurus inside of data visualization. So we could build houses before we had hammers and saws. The tools just let us do it better. That is assuming we've developed the skills to use the tools effectively. So this is very powerful to me because what it's telling us is the tools that we were given were Excel, Power BI, Looker, Tableau, as we were just talking about. But it's the skill set that allows you to really hone in on that story and use data to help make those tactical day-to-day -day decisions. So in today's PowerPoint, we are going to be walking through using formatting within Excel. This applies to everything as noted with Tableau, Power BI, but Excel is one of the most common applications used today. Even though it's not the preferred data science application, it is easy to use, and so we'll be walking through some of the formatting. So starting off, we need to understand some of the best practices that truly help us tell the story within data. So the first thing to consider is that simple is better. When you present in front of an audience, you don't want them distracted. You just want to tell your message and get it across very quickly and effectively. The next thing we're gonna do is emphasize only what is important. Again, tying back to simple is better. You don't want to put more on the screen than, is what, than what's needed. In this example, we can use bold, we can use color, we can use size, proximity, or other metrics or other various ways to emphasize only what we want the audience to see. One thing to consider is that we should be using neutral or non-emphasis colors while considering using a colorblind scheme. So according to the U.S. National Library of Medicine, one in 12 males and one in 200 females are colorblind. That's roughly 4.5% of the population according to colorblind awareness. So by using this colorblind scheme, we're able to use colors that are both neutral and available for our entire audience. With that, we should also be consistent throughout the entire presentation or dashboard. Jumping around colors or jumping around formatting causes the user to be distracted, and it can also imply that something has changed. So if we're using one color to indicate something is good, it should be the same across, same thing with bad. A good way is to apply the traffic color pattern where you're using red, yellow, and green and use it consistently throughout. You should also know your audience. Presenting to a frontline employee like a manager or a call center representative can be very different than presenting to an executive. Executives can tend to want to see KPIs rolled up at an aggregate level where the frontline may want to see that detailed information to be very tactical and so they can start driving those decisions in the moment. So knowing your audience will allow you to tailor the data to that story. Then we should also be providing baselines or comparisons when possible. Baselines allow us to know whether something is good or bad. And the old adage goes, what gets managed gets measured. And then we need to know what it's being compared against. So if you didn't know if 95 is good or bad, having that baseline or that comparison allows you to know. So first, let's jump into simple is better. So the first thing we want to do is remove unnecessary noise. So what this allows your audience to do is focus on what truly is important. One thing to consider is real estate is precious. You don't want to try and force a grid line, tick marks, or other visualization uh, features that would allow that user to become distracted. We also want to draw the user or the viewer to what you want them to see. Attention spans are very limited. Uh, in today's business world, especially with mobile phones and everything during meetings, so we want to be sure to draw our audience to what we want them to look at. 
This allows them to quickly identify and then start listening to you again, rather than scanning the graph to understand everything that's there. We also wanna tell them what is important. If you were to consider that this PowerPoint gets left behind, you don't want your audience trying to interpret that information on their own. You want them to know exactly what you were trying to tell them. So you wanna emphasize the important information. Don't waste your time on the non-important. So said differently, again, if you left it behind, what would your audience remember from what you said? So in this, we're gonna look at an example. So this is an out of the box format. So this is very common in Excel where you go up and you hit the recommended graph or you just create your own line graph. I also added a table down there to show you some common examples that I have seen in my professional experience where it would show the line graph and then a table below. In this example, we're looking at made up data. Uh, this is for test scores from Mr. Day's class. And in here, what we're gonna be looking at is how can we simplify this to tell a better story? So with just minor data visualization best practices, we can simplify this to show exactly what we wanna see. Now I'll walk you through how I got to that, but you can see the reduction of the noise. You can see that we simplified it to truly draw their attention to this dark blue line. So first let's start off with talking about tables before we jump into bar graphs and line graphs. So tables, in my experience, are one of the most commonly preferred methods of data visualizations. Whether it's a client, a provider, an internal stakeholder, people tend to lean on these because they're comfortable with the layout of them. They are very useful in presenting data. It's in an organized way. It can show by column and by row. And then it also allows you to quickly look and say, in this example, Jack, test 377. Something to consider is that most softwares, including Tableau, Power BI, and Excel, have a default setting called automatic. This is a dark gray to black border and font. And whenever you create it, this is the generic layout it will build that information in. However, we can improve these. So the way that we're gonna look at this is to first identify what do we wanna improve in the table. So the first thing in my opinion is the automatic setting is bland. If I look at this, there's no color. I don't know where to look. So what I wanna do is start improving this. The other thing is, as an audience member, I'm left scanning this entire table for trends and insights. I don't know if Jack is outperforming Mary without a couple seconds review. And is, as the audience, I don't know what my main takeaways are. This leads to wasted time and also potential misinterpretation of data. So now what we're gonna do is start to format this table. So what we do is add a little bit of color. So in this example, I added a very dark red to show you how it pops. So we've now separated out the headers and the title from that data set. So you can see that test nine is now different than Jack scores. So we add color to remove the blandness. The user is a little bit more engaged, but the challenge is they're still left searching for that story. They don't know what the call outs are, and they don't have a baseline to understand if Jack or Mary is the highest performer. So again, we want a format. So now what we're gonna do, we're gonna keep improving. So what we're gonna do is now apply some simple best practices. So in this example, you can see I've emphasized the title. So we've bolded and increased the font size for test scores from Mr. Day's class. We've also separated out the headers by using a neutralized gray, said differently, a light gray, and we've bolded those field names to make it easier to know that those are the columns. We have neutralized the borders to a very light gray color. And then we've added a road row shading to where we can see Jack is different than Mary. Now I challenge you, scan across from left to right and look at Jack's scores. You typically will stay on that line as Mary is in a light blue color. What this allows you to do is start to look at Jack and follow his trend line versus Mary or down to Susie and Blake. So we have removed the bland in this example. Users now see an improved presentation, but the challenge to them is they're still left for the call out. So even though we've removed it, we've done some data visualization best practices, I still don't know the main call outs as the audience. Again, let's not waste time. So we're gonna improve the formatting and add just a little bit more. So now what we're going to do is add in some bold emphasis 
to draw your attention to where we want you to look. So in this example, your eyes immediately draw where we want you to. So we're looking at test four for Jack, where he scored a 56. Test one for Mary was a 70. You're drawn to this by using the color red, which is very different and it's very bold compared to the neutralized gray and blue. Using those neutral colors as the background allow your eyes to go exactly where I want them to. However, tables are not always the best use for data visualization. This is where we'll get more into line graph. So if I were to ask you quickly, which student is doing better or worse than they started and how long does it take you to figure that out? Could you answer it? Well, fun times, because we have a pop quiz. So the first question I'm gonna ask you guys, which student do you think performed the best based off of this data set? All right, now you have the answer. What was that, to, that student's worst test score? Don't worry, there's an easier and quicker way to identify than asking you to look at upwards of 40 rows of data or 40 uh, data sets and say, what is Jack's best score? And the use of that is using a line graph. So in this example, what I've done is added the automatic line graph that Excel has built in. And here, what we're looking at is the exact same data set, but now we're showing it in a line graph. What this allows us to do is quickly see the trends and insights that may come out of this data set. So now when I ask you, which student performed the best? And what was that student's worst score? It's easier to identify that pattern. So in here, we're looking at Jack. Jack starts off the highest. So that would be something that would draw my immediate attention when reviewing this data. He goes down a little bit, and overall, I would guess that he performs the highest because the blue is consistently at the top. So his average would only slightly be above Mary, who is in orange, because she had less volatility amongst her test scores. So if I were to answer this, I would guess Jack, with his lowest being in test four. Again, if I were to ask you this up here, you would have to visualize each individual line in your head and then interpret that information only to look again to find that lowest score. So in a line graph, it's easier to spot trends, but there's ways to improve a line graph. So the first thing that we wanna do is we wanna set the axis. So going back to the original, you saw it was zero to 120. Well, our test scores are a max of 100, so what we've done over here is set it to zero to 100 to make sure that we have an equal axis for the scores to be evaluated on, nothing more, nothing less. We also deleted the grid lines. The grid lines were competing for the space against the actual line, and it was drawing away the attention from what we wanted to look at, which was the data. It is worth noting that grid lines can be valuable, but in this example, it didn't offer us up much. We also wanted to justify the title. So in here, I wanted the user to know exactly what they were looking at. In the automatic setting, it's centered and it's a light colored font. So I wanted to bold it and let them know that if they were to take this away, we are looking at test scores for Mr. Day's class. Lastly, we wanted to emphasize it. I want it to be bold and I darkened the font, but I didn't make it black because black is very bold. I used a darker gray. So now we're going to improve it a little bit more. So the first thing that I want to do is take that exact same layout and I'm going to adjust the colors. So in this example, I used a more neutral color scheme. Again, we should always be considering a colorblind uh, scheme so that way our audience can see these, especially when you start to get into colors that could look very similar. Um, we're using non-emphasis colors. So the other example used a very bright green, bright yellow, orange, we want to neutralize that and push it a little bit more into the background, and I'll detail why in a little bit. The next thing is I want to use different colors for ease of reference. Now, within this, you can see we have a couple values, and with this, we can select a couple different colors. If these were all the same blue or just slightly different versions of blue, it would be hard to know who's doing what. So now let's take this a little bit further. I want to use emphasis colors. So 
we've taken it and we use neutral colors, but we want to emphasize something. So I asked the question earlier, who scored the best? By looking at the data, I have emphasized that Jack has scored the best by using a very dark blue. So in this example, we also changed our colors to using blue and gray. With dark blue being the emphasis color, I tend to stay with blue and gray because it's more common and more universal color. Um, you can also choose whatever one you want. It's worth noting that some clients require their colors and that's not a bad time um, to go ahead and introduce those. So if you have a client like that very bright red we used earlier on our table, this is where we could go in and actually use that red instead of that blue. It is worth noting you don't want to have a lot of different colors in here. You just want to stay relatively consistent, but I tend to stay with gray and blue. Again, with this emphasis color drawing your attention to Jack. Now, the one thing to consider is not everything needs to shout. You don't need a ton of emphasis because that's where the user feels everything is bold, everything is important, and it almost removes that emphasis on what we wanted to talk about. So now what we're gonna do is compare this against our original. So now you can see after data visualization designing, what we've done is we've added a emphasis color to emphasize Jack's test scores. We've neutralized the other colors. We've removed those grid lines. And then we also set the axis to an, a more appropriate scale. Uh, what we've also done is corrected the title. So this is the before. Again, software out of the gate. What we're looking at is the automatic settings for the title. You can see these grid lines that are competing against those colors. We took out the bright colors because we had no idea what was important. We set the axis with the max score at 100. We also cleaned up the title to make it more prominent. So with just a little bit of work, we can take the automatic setting inside of a software and clean it up. Now that is not to say that this is wrong by any means. There's always more improvement to do. I think of data visualization as more of a continuous improvement exercise. What are you presenting and knowing your audience allows you to know how to tailor this? In this example, Blake may be the call out we wanted to make, or it may be something else that we need to add. And that's what we're about to review. All right, so how do you add that little something extra? So what we're gonna review on this one is some additional steps that you can take to add that extra layer for this. So the first one that we're gonna to wanna to look at is how you can use annotations to narrate a call out. So in here, what we've done is we've highlighted the emphasis for Jack and we've put annotation on the graph to show that Jack achieved the highest grade, but scored the worst on Newton's exam in test four. You can see it's the lowest point of that line graph and it allows us to add that little something extra. You also are gonna to wanna to add the data source reference. So think of this like a research paper. You're gonna to want to let the user know when you pulled the data. So if they try to replicate it, and if anything has changed, they understand why. But you're also gonna to wanna to let them know the sources. So this would be similar to a final deliverable that you would see inside of your data science projects, where you just want to give that citation. The next thing is adding a baseline. We've addressed this on a couple other areas, but ultimately that baseline becomes very critical because it allows your user to know exactly what they're comparing against. So let's take a look at how that would look on this graph. So you can see we've removed everybody else. We're really only focused on Jack, but now we need to know, did Jack perform well against others within the classroom, already knowing that he has the highest score? So what we're doing is bringing in the average test score for each test. So in here, you can see that we've added an, an average line. This can be called a reference line or anything else within a different program. Within Excel, you can actually add this just by creating a new line and calling it average, or you can do a shape if you want it to be a fixed line across. But in here, I didn't want to emphasize this too much, so I made it a dotted line. You can also make it a solid line, skinny the bandwidth, and then create a more neutralized gray. But what, what we wanted to do here was actually just show how is Jack comparing. So we know that this is his worst test, and that uh, now we can actually see it. So test four, he was below average, and he also scored the lowest on that. And then lastly, what we're gonna wanna do is adding data labels instead of using these legends. So as I add these, 
you're going to see that Jack is the top line and the average is the dotted line. In most cases, you'll, you would remove this because it makes it simpler to reference back and forth. So I left that on there just to show you how a user would look at this and say, if I did not have that, I'm looking at the dark blue. Okay, that's Jack. Now imagine there's two or three more and you're gonna have to keep jumping back and forth between the colors. In this example, you would not want to add too many colors down into the bottom. Same thing with the data labels. You don't want to overwhelm your viewer. And so what you would do is try to limit this to about five or six. Uh, that tends to be where I lean with a line graph is not overwhelming them because then uh, a user cannot discern any differences. There are other ways that you can emphasize as well. So the first one we're gonna to wanna to look at is how can you bold something? So the statement we're making here, Jack averaged an 85% for the course, the highest in the class. We used a bold font there to emphasize that we're only focusing on highest in the class. Now, something else to consider is you see that I've done this for text. This can apply to email. It can apply to PowerPoint or any other text format where you want to emphasize something within a statement. However, bold is not the only one that we have. We also have italicized. So Jack averaged an 85% for the course, the highest in the class. You can see it emphasizes exactly where we want the user to look, which is right here. Same thing with bold, and it draws your attention to it. I would be careful with using italicized just because of the multiple ways it can be used within formatting. Size, so in here, Jack averaged an 85% for the course, the highest in the class. You'll see that we changed what we wanted to call out, 85% for the course. And ultimately, uh, we left it here in the same exact writing, but what you have the ability to do is, if you feel that looks off, right, it's in the very center of this statement, you wanna change how this looks, you can rewrite it. That's the beauty of data visualization is you can keep changing your view and you can keep changing your text as long as the story is the same to fit whatever visualization you're trying to make. Now, the one thing I will say is you don't wanna force any visualization, so don't change your data to exactly fit it, but maybe rewrite something to make it show the way you'd like. Lastly, we're gonna look at color. So Jack averaged an 85% for the course, the highest in the class. We're making use of the color green here where we're emphasizing the very end of that statement. So this ties back into our keys uh, earlier where we talked about the best practices where you're emphasize some, emphasizing something and what you wanna do is bold, italicize, size, color. And there's a couple other, other ones like proximity whenever you're talking about graphing. But ultimately, uh, there are other ways to successfully emphasize something, whether it's text or on a graph. So what did we learn? We walked through a line graph, we walked through why it's better than a table to visualize it, but there are some other things that we should take into consideration. So line graphs should be used for time and series-based analysis. Categorical analysis should be done in a bar graph. And we'll walk through an example here in a second, but there are some softwares that actually lock a user's ability to perform line graphs on non-numerical values. So what that means is they don't even let you select a line graph if they don't think it should be used. Now that's not to say that it is always the correct answer uh, because I cannot speak to how some of the softwares are set up, but I trust, for example, Tableau. Tableau will not let me build a line graph without the exact dimensions and measures that I need. So here's an example where we take the mean score by student. So we have Jack through Blake. And the one thing to note with this is they're not correlated. They're not linked unless, of course, they were cheating, which would be a bigger problem than having this in a line graph. But what we want to do is make sure that if we're showing the representation, it's the correct graph. So right now, what we're looking at is something that implies that the trend is going down. and That is not accurate, right? So Jack and Blake, again, have no correlation in theory or in practice. And so what we want to do is break them up to say there is no trend line associated with those mean scores. So now we look at the bar graphs. So in here, we see how Jack, Mary, Susie, and Blake all performed. They're all independent of each other. Again, assuming no cheating is taking place. And ultimately what we can see is that same trend where you say it slightly goes down from Jack to Mary, Susie to Blake. And if this was in any other sort, let's say it's uh, alphabetical 
A through Z. Blake would be at the beginning, and then you'd see a jump up to Jack, a slight decrease down to Mary, and then a little bit down to Susie. What would end up happening is you could discern that same trend, but it wouldn't imply that it's flowing together. So next, and this is probably the most popular and probably going to get the most questions at the end, is the need to avoid pie charts. So pie charts are probably one of the more common uh, graphs that I'll be asked for, but they're extremely hard to accurately read. Now, they also take up a lot of real estate and real estate, and I'm going to say it multiple times today, real estate is very precious. When you're building a dashboard, you don't want it to be um, you know, forced in there with a bunch of big graphs that don't drive a lot of value. The example I'll always use is you have three seconds to get your audience's attention. And what do you want to articulate in those three seconds? And if a pie graph is not getting that across, then you're wasting that time. So in this example, what we've done is we've added in uh, their extra credit points. So what we would be saying is Jack scored this many, Mary scored this many, Susie, Blake, et cetera. Now the challenge with that's going to be could you quickly tell me how many more points Jack scored than Susie or how many more he scored than Blake? Same thing. What's the difference between Mary and Jack? Now we could add data labels to make this a little bit easier to understand, but the challenge is we're not trained to look at something and compare each shape in a way uh, that this is set up. So now what we're going to do is throw this into a bar graph and show how much easier it is to read. So now we're looking at extra credit points as a bar graph. You'll see that I emphasize Jack. I've removed the axis on the side. I've added the data labels. And again, I know that those can simplify the pie graphs. But what we're looking at here is that decline. So I can look at Jack to Blake and say, confidently, I know that he scored three more or X percent more. Now within a pie graph, it's going to be a little bit harder to make that. I'm not saying it's impossible. It just takes our users traditionally a little bit longer to do. Now, I'll close this out um, because I know data visualization, there's a ton of topics we can talk about. There's a ton of things. Uh, I don't want to go too deep into pie charts today, but one of the things I'm going to close this with is one of my favorite quotes from Bernard Marr, who, again, is an extreme expert in this, a uh, ton of publications online. I'd encourage anybody to read his blogs. So he says, okay, they're not evil, but I'd go so far as to say that in the vast majority of the cases that pie deserves to be banned from the boardroom, unless it's the edible variety. I think that sums it up best. Um, even if I didn't do the best job articulating it, um, there are many experts out there with a ton of publications on it. I would encourage everybody to go out and read that. Um, and then, you know, ask me questions later if you'd like. So now we're going to talk about access usage. You saw me take it out of that bar graph and I'm going to explain why. So first, when we're setting an access, uh, the scale of it should be set in for a full range rather than just what's visible. So what do I mean by that? So in those test scores, we could say that Blake scored a 64, so the lowest is a 60. The highest is a 90 because that's what Jack scored is an 85. So what we've done is set this from 60 to 90 with five as our interval. Now the challenge with this is by looking at it, Blake to Jack would imply that he scored, Jack scored, four times better than Blake. Because if we look at those intervals, we see that Blake is in the bottom 60 to 65, which is one bin. 65 to 70 is two bins. And we can see that Jack is all the way at the highest. Now, while those scores are accurate and 85 to 64 does imply that he outperformed them, it's not to 4X. So if we were to rebuild this, now what we're looking at is a zero to 100 because 100 is the max that somebody could score. And then zero is, our lowest because you could in theory score zero. So now we've neutralized it and we said, Jack scored an 84 to Blake's, um, <laughs> excuse me, Jack scored an 85 to Blake's 64. You can see it's not 4X, he has outscored him, but not to that degree. So this is important because I'll regularly see graphs that are set with access to only the data um, range, which is not always accurate because you do wanna capture that outside. But there are some additional considerations that we need to take. So if we're using data labels, the axis becomes redundant. You saw that on the bar graph I had where I've added them. It's just repeating. You don't need a bar graph to tell you the data value is 85 and an axis. We want simple because it allows our users to quickly understand what's there. Because simple is better. So remove the axis and let the data labels do the talking. So down here, you can see I've removed the axis. 
So now we're just looking at this and it's 85, 83, et cetera. What this allows me to do is not have to keep scanning left and right back to the axis, even though the data values are there, I can easily see that on top of the bar graph. So the next thing is, if you're keeping the axis, remove the tick marks. Now tick marks are those little lines that are next to the 90s and the 80s that show you where they are. Since we've removed our grid lines, that just becomes excess noise. So we'd want to remove those as well. However, if you're keeping the grid lines, you have the tick marks, make sure that you're gonna set it to a light gray. And the reason for this is when you set it to a light gray, it pulls it out of the forefront of the graph and it allows the graph to speak to itself. And then the grid lines can help you just easier navigate it. So an example of this would be where we're using a grid line to tell a baseline. So what we've done is used a reference line or a baseline as a grid line to say, right here is where the A grade starts. So 90%. These are pretty popular inside of Tableau. I make use of those as well as bands to kind of tell a user this is where I would expect them to score. So if I'm saying 90% or a 90 is where you would score an A, I can easily see Mary is right there. Uh, she is below that line, same thing with Jack. And then what ends up happening is I have a reference point. I need to know exactly what I'm comparing against because as a user, I don't know, did an 85 start for, I'm sorry, an A start at 95? Is it an 85? It just gives you a different point of uh, reference. So there's also some other things that we can do to help improve this. So this is where we'll take um, the axis and we've already neutralized it. Again, we've talked about data values, but there's other ways that we can improve on a bar graph. So first thing, and I keep saying it today, using emphasis colors to call out an insight. So now what we've done is we left it in that gray scale. We've dropped in the blue to highlight Mary because something about Mary just popped off the page when we looked at our line graph. So what we're gonna do now is annotate it. So we're going to say, that Mary had the lowest standard deviation, scoring the most consistent throughout the year. Now, what this tells me as the professor or as the teacher is that she may have had the best or most consistent studying routine, or she would be eligible to be a tutor because she's scoring so well, whereas Jack struggled on a certain test. It just gives us that extra layer for us to go back and start looking at that information. Now, one of the bigger challenges we'll always run into as data analysts is the branding requirements that come with a lot of data visual visualizations that we have. So in this, we can have a lot of client or internal stakeholders. They require a color scheme that is very bold, very bright. Now that can obviously bring its own challenges when we're talking about using neutral colors or a colorblind palette that allows us to easier make those call outs. So one of the first things that we'll see is this graph down here, everything was put into a very bright red. This red is a pretty common color for a lot of um, retailers, a lot of companies, um, a couple come to mind that are in the Fortune 500. So now what we wanna do is say, how can we help move away from this, but allow them to keep that branding? So the first thing that we're gonna do is suggest the brand color as the emphasis color. So what we see here, is we're going to change this and say the red is only used when we want to talk about Mary like we did on the previous example. Now we can make use of any secondary color. In this example, luckily they had a light blue and we're going to drop that in as our neutral color. We can also show them alternatives, including the colorblind scheme by explaining the value behind it. Uh, when you talk about the population, again, that 4.5%, that's a high number to go in and say, here's why we would recommend it. And as the analyst, uh, it is my belief that they're leaning on us to be those subject matter expertise. You can also work with marketing to see if you're able to lighten the colors. Now, I'm not an HTML professional. Um, I won't even pretend to tell you guys how to do it, but there are ways that you can lighten a color. And if the marketing team allows it, then that's where you would be able to use those as neutral colors and then use that emphasis color as your emphasizer. The other thing that you can do, and this is something that I'll do regularly, is just talk to them and putting a logo in the top corner will satisfy a lot of the ask they might have. So when I tend to stay with those grays and those blues, what I'll do is I'll work with them to say, I'm gonna use a dark gray as my emphasis color, and I'm gonna use a light gray as my neutral or base color. And then I'm gonna put their logo in the top because for a majority, Gray applies to a lot of companies. 
even if you have something that is yellow or red, that gray is going to uh, pair very well with it. So that's where we can use that as um, you know, that backup color. And then all, honestly, you're gonna win some, you're gonna lose some. Uh, that's gonna be the other challenge we're gonna have is you don't want to push so hard that um, you almost steer the project away from where you want it to. You wanna partner with everybody as much as possible. You wanna provide your subject matter expertise. And then in addition to that, you also wanna know when to say it makes the most sense for our client to just move forward with it because we're here to consult with them. We're here to provide them best practices, but ultimately best practices are not always gonna win the audience. So just be firm, but also articulate well why you believe the branding should be eased into a different uh, best practice, if you will, and then that will help that conversation go. But know, again, when to say, okay, it makes sense just to use the branding, and then work with them to figure out where else in the dashboard you can start to use those neutral colors. So some other additional considerations when you're pulling this all together. So be creative. Different graphs can lead to different insights. You saw it when I was looking at the line graph versus the bar graph. The line graph allowed me to see how somebody was trending. So I knew Jack was doing awesome until he struggled on test four. I knew Mary was doing really well just consistently, wasn't scoring above 90, wasn't scoring below, call it 75. Um, and I knew that she had the least volatility of everybody. So I would want to look into her pattern. Uh, next, we put it into a bar graph and we saw Jack scored really well, but the challenge with that is he scored really well and he had that one bad test. Now, Mary is going to just go ahead and have that volatility that we're going to want to um, work through. I'm sorry, she did not have the volatility that Jack did. So it's going to allow us just to quickly identify her pattern where she scored an 83, which was the best in the, the second best in the class. So the next thing we're going to look at is real estate on a dashboard. Again, I've said this uh, a couple times. Real estate is precious. You don't want to waste it on low value charts because when you waste it on low value charts, what ends up happening is you're drawing your audience to something that's not going to help them ultimately. I'll lean on it again. I always believe you have three seconds or less to capture your audience's attention. And if they're wasting it, trying to figure out what that chart is telling them, you're losing your audience. So make sure that it's really captivating and you're not wasting it on items like a pie chart. So common examples, pie charts and gauge charts. Um, those are just two big ones that they take up a lot of space. There's other ways that you can present the data in a more impactful and quicker way to identify it. Because again, if I'm an executive, I don't want to try to read something and waste a lot of time figuring out what the data is telling me. It should be very easy to understand what it's telling me. Don't be afraid to use the same chart type throughout the dashboard. So this is something I'll see regularly where somebody wants to use a line graph versus using a bar graph because they don't want to see both of them on the same. I'm sorry, they don't want to see two bar graphs on the same dashboard. So they keep trying to force it into a line graph when it really should just be a bar graph. So don't be afraid. If you have four bar graphs on a dashboard, that's fine. As long as your data is easy to read and the visualization tells the story you want, you've done your job. Also, you don't want to force it. This is why I use that line graph as an example. Don't force a graphic. Don't go in and make drastic changes to your data because you know in your head you want it to look a certain way. Let the data help tell that story. So as I noted earlier, some programs block their use for a reason. So the image on the right shows you a Tableau screenshot where I drug up a measure and a dimension and it told me I could not do anything except a bar graph. The reason for that is because I didn't satisfy what the program has said I needed to build a line graph to build a scatter plot or whatever that graph I really wanted is. So as an expert, it's uh, Tableau being the expert, you don't want to force it because they built the logic there for a reason. One of the other things to consider is if you're using a single value, consider using a text over a graph. So in this example, what we're looking at is a bar graph that says here's 95%, which was the top test score of all of them. So whether it's the student or the actual test, this was the best grade in the class. So you can see that this takes up and it violates our Bullet number two, don't waste the, uh, the real estate on precious. Don't waste the real estate um, because it's precious. So what we want to do here is say, well, how else can we rewrite this? So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it in the text. So I'm going to say it's 95% top test score. So you'll see I took the title of our chart, dropped it down into a slightly neutralized second line, 
And then I've popped it and said 95%. I've used that emphasis text to say 95% is bold. The size is telling you exactly what I want you to see. And then from there, what you're able to do is know exactly what I want. And we're not wasting nearly as much space as we are over here. You could obviously shrink this down, but who's to say it's going to tell you exactly as impactful as we are seeing right here. You can also use this 95% for other things like pie charts or gauges where you're looking at uh, numbers and you're just really focused on a single one. Or if you're trying to change it, uh, again, I say if it's a single value, just put it into a text. It's simple. It's easy. You can do it in Tableau. You can do it in Power BI and you can do it in Excel. So today we've covered a lot. Uh, I know that there is a ton more out there in the data visualization space. Um, by no means am I going to pretend that we covered everything. I wanted to high level walk you guys through how we use best practices to help our audiences and help tell the story that we're seeing within our data. If you're wanting to learn more, uh, these are some of the resources that I've used along my journey and I would strongly recommend them. So we have storytelling with data by Cole Nussbaumer, and I hope I'm saying that right. And if you're here today, uh, thanks for watching, and I'm sorry if I ruined that last name. Uh, information dashboard designed by Stephen Pugh. So I quoted Stephen Pugh earlier. Uh, he is honestly one of my, my favorites, right? Um, he has a lot of great stuff out there. There's a great article on Tableau's blogs about some of the best practices. Um, you can read that, it's more in depth, and it just provides you a lot of good stuff. He also has a book out there um, as obviously information dashboards design. It's one of my favorites as well. But then there's also books by Edward Tufte and Bernard Marr, um, some of the leading people out there. And Edward Tufte even has a class. Uh, I don't know where it's located, uh, but I've read really good reviews on it as I've just always been looking at data visualization blogs or anything out there. Uh, he has a lot of great books out there, um, but there's also a lot more, right? There's websites out there that are devoted to data visualization. I know there's a couple other talks here uh, around data visualization. Storytelling is becoming a lot more popular. Uh, so we definitely want to make sure that we're putting the resources out there and we're helping educate everybody. So uh, definitely encourage everybody here to go out and read a little bit more. There's so much that can be covered. Uh, hopefully you learned something today. Uh, but first I'd like to say thank you guys. You have been great. Thank you for the opportunity to speak in front of you guys. Uh, I'll be available for questions. You can also hit me up on LinkedIn. I'm happy to walk through my logic and how I've learned some of this stuff. Um, so thank you again. You've been great. All right. Thank you very much, Rob. And I think that was a uh, that was a great talk because one of the things that we always need to keep our eye on uh, as we are talking about uh, doing cloud implementations, doing cloud migrations, you know, moving analytics workloads so we can uh, perform bigger operations and do more complicated things. Data storytelling is really doesn't change because this is what makes the human connection with our models, whether it's an AI model or a machine learning model or whether we're performing, you know, traditional descriptive analytics or prescriptive analytics, you know, we, we need to be able to put that into a form that humans can easily understand. And so that's, I think, why, why this is so important uh, as a discipline, right? And also, I think why it's grown so tremendously because, you know, let's be honest, a lot of the data visualization that's been happening, uh, really a lot of which started in the 1990s, wasn't that great. And, you know, there's a tremendous amount of improvement that's happened since then, you know, and the tools have gotten tremendously better. And uh, there, you know, as a result, a lot of the visualizations that have been promulgated in the ecosystem have also become a lot better, you know, and, and uh, you know, and as a result, data journalism has really picked up and we're seeing a lot of, a lot of the top um, uh, newspapers and magazines and, and uh, these organizations really focusing a lot of effort on data visualization and a lot of them actually have uh you know they actually have data storytelling um roles right that are actually in their organizations where that's effectively people's jobs is to turn stories uh that are of public interest into data visualizations and then obviously mm -hmm. you know, publish those so that's why i think this is such an interesting space because that is that has been accelerating um drastically over the last few years and the the um uh, the, the, the density of visualizations that we're seeing out there in the wild. So, so very, very fascinating. Uh, we do want to take some questions. We are taking questions on Twitter as well as in our uh, event chat. We'll pull some of those off here in a second. Before we get to everybody else's questions, uh, I was wondering, Rob, how do you feel about time series pie charts? 
Uh, so I, I still try to stay away from pie charts, right? Uh, again, it's a not a waste of real estate, but it does consume a lot anytime you're breaking those out. Some interesting things that I've seen is almost a combo chart where you'll have a line graph or you'll have something broken out that allows you to view everything in that time series. And within Tableau, and I, I haven't done this in Excel, but you can use a pie chart as maybe uh, that marker. It, it will allow you to pull that out. So rather than using it on a dashboard, you can use it in an interactive setting um, that allows your user to almost heat seek into what they're looking for. I still tend to stay away from pie charts again on just storytelling because if I were to leave that behind to an executive, my main focus during storytelling is, am I leaving the right message and can they interpret this information in three seconds or left? less? And in my experience, pie charts don't enable us to do that. That is perfect. Um, and so um, one of the questions that just came across is, how do you know if a color screen, a color scheme is colorblind friendly? So some have it built into the actual uh, software. So uh, some of them you can download. I know that Tableau, you can download it in within a preference. There's a text file that you have on anybody that has desktop downloaded. You can load that HTML color palette into your preference and you can have it available. Uh, some other ones, and I, I don't know this about Microsoft Office, but uh, there are palettes that you can go online and download. So if you went to office.com, I would definitely research that. I've been very fortunate that I was able to download that HTML palette. You can Google it, it's out there. Um, what you tend to see is it sticks to more of your traditional colorblind um, colors and it doesn't deviate from it. So it, it doesn't limit you to a select block of colors, but I believe it comes with only 10 default ones. Um, and then as I've built, what I've wanted to do is stay in that. Uh, so one of the things that I also have the luxury is I have a colorblind friend and I've actually sent him stuff that I've been working on with work and asked him to review it. Um, and then he'll come back and give me his input on it to where if I've adjusted the opacity or anything like that, it can make it not as friendly. And that's where it becomes a challenge. So I would start off Googling it again, adjust your preferences. If you have something like Tableau, I can't speak to anything like Click or Looker, but I would assume, you know, they're all great products out there. So they should have something readily available. If not, inside of Excel, you can actually Google, I'm sorry, go to office.com and look to see if they have one ready. If not, you can just customize it by typing in that HTML scheme. Uh, that's, uh, that's excellent advice. Uh, another question that we have here is, uh, why do you recommend against using pie charts? Can you kind of dive into that a little bit? Yeah, so uh, pie charts and you know some of this, I'm not a medical professional, so I don't I want to get that out there now. Um, based off what I've read over the you know last 10 years of my life, a lot of it is around our ability to decipher that data that's in there. So if we went back to that pie chart that we had, it's really challenging to tell that Jack was just slightly above Mary because if you look at how the pie chart distributes it, it can actually just make it look like the exact same size because percentages two to 3% different uh, can look very similar in a pie chart. Now, the other thing that I've come across um, just in my experience is anytime I start to get below about a 10% when you do it as a percent of total, uh, it starts to hide that. And then what you're gonna have to do is add a very large legend, potentially on the side if you have more than five or six, and that legend starts to take up a lot of space. Or if it's something where you've done a data label to say, um, let's, you know, we'll go back to the classroom example, let's say we added in test one through nine and test four was Newton's and you're adding the exact name of that test and the score, what you're going to do is get a lot of data overlap or it's going to have to take some out or it's going to expand it so large that it's going to take up more of the screen than just using a basic bar graph. It's going to tell you the exact same information, but in a quicker um, and I'm going to call it less uh, real estate consuming way. And that's why I tend to lean on them. Again, I'm sure that there is something out there where somebody has said, hey, it's a great way to show this. I'm not saying that's wrong. Uh, what I'm saying is in my experience, it, it's been easier to use a bar graph because of the real estate consumption um, and then also the ease of understanding it. Excellent. And um, another question, how would you put a word cloud into a dashboard? So word clouds are becoming increasingly popular. Um, I, I notice them a lot more, especially uh, people are taking Twitter and they're starting to load the tweets into it, uh, especially during the presidential debates uh, a couple years ago. And the way that I would do that is be very cautious about what you're doing, because as you load more and more word clouds, um, I'm going to say our audiences aren't adapted to those yet. It is still a relatively new data visualization, but they can be very powerful. 
So if you are going to do something like that, make sure that you're keeping it to a limit where you're not just showing a ton of words. And then you also want to remove stop words. So the, a, and those are not value added. Uh, somebody doesn't need to know every time the word the is said, but they may need to know every time uh, going back to the, you know, the presidential debate was economics. That could be one of the top buzzwords. And by seeing it in a word cloud, you can quickly draw your attention to it, similar to how you would with a bar graph. And so what I would say is build both of them, right? Uh, this is where different insights could come out of it. We talked about that earlier. Uh, so by seeing the word cloud, it may tell a better story than a bar graph, because if you have more than 25 or 50 words that you want to call out the use of, a bar graph is going to start to get really compressed. So that's where a word cloud can become very valuable. But again, I would keep it limited because once you start to get above a certain number, it's just going to become the entire dashboard. And then also make sure you're removing those stop words, uh, which are the, a, and, and you know, many more. And there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, Python, I believe, has a pretty cool NLTK package that has stop words in it that you can export out. Uh, same thing, you can Google those and get those. And then if you're doing this in Excel or you're doing it in another software, you can actually remove those um, from your analysis. But word clouds are good. Uh, I would just always add a little bit of education if your audience is a little bit confused on it. Excellent. Thank you for that. Uh, next question that we have is, how many colors is too many for a dashboard? So that, again, is going to be more of a judgment call. Um, you saw earlier I had four for the test. That wasn't so overwhelming to the audience because I wasn't presenting a ton of different colors. But I would be cautious above going from four or five because, especially as they're stacked on top of each other, it's going to start to become harder to discern and separate out what that information is. Uh, I tend to stay within, again, that blue and gray color because what it allows me to do is just use slightly different shades. And then my emphasis color is the one that pops. And then that calls out that, hey, they are different, but I don't want you to focus on that. So that's where if you're using emphasis colors, it allows you to stay within those two. Uh, it doesn't have to be blue, gray. Again, I would recommend just because it's a more universal color that can be applied as maybe the fifth color in a um, company's palette. But I would not go above five or six just because then it becomes a little bit overwhelming. And if you are going to use it and you want them to draw attention to it, make sure that they're just different enough that the user is going to be able to see it using a slightly brighter or less green is going to be a little bit challenging trying to stay in that neutral uh, zone because i mean as you can imagine green doesn't really have a lot of neutral options so if you are going to use it just make sure that it visually um, doesn't draw too much attention to it great tips um next question is do you use gauges and dashboards I try to stay away from gauges. Um, so similar to a pie chart, they're in theory very similar, right? So gauges are great, but if you look at that 95% test score that we talked about, and I'm actually gonna back up just to show you guys, uh, this 95% tells you exactly what a gauge tells you, right? It can show you where the, the band or the reference lines are. So I'm gonna lean back to my car. When I'm getting low on fuel and it starts to go in the red, I know I need, immediately need to action it. But that's where you can use a simple bar graph. You can use something like uh, a text to, to call that out. And it's not as overwhelming. Uh, gauges are one of the most popular requests I have seen out there. I think that was put out a couple years ago as you know, one of the first dashboards built. And it was around IT KPIs. Uh, so I would recommend going away from them. Again, they, they consume a lot of real estate. If your audience insists or your stakeholders insist on having them in, work with them to understand how you can do it. Same thing applies to a donut chart, uh, which is a pie chart with a center hollowed out where you could put this 95%. That's something else to consider is they do eat up a lot of real estate. So if you have it and your audience really wants it, okay. Um, but I would still try to lean towards some of these other practices out there. Uh, I believe that's why uh, I'm going to lean on my Tableau knowledge here. Tableau doesn't offer gauge as a out of the box chart. You actually have to figure out a way to get to that. Um, that's the same thing with some other softwares out there is it's not one of the best practices for those reasons. Yeah, so it's, it's very intentional that they're uh, kind of guiding you away from using gauges. Yeah, that, I mean, that's my belief on that. And I mean, you've seen the Bernard Marr quote. There's a lot out there where people are recommending not to use it for those reasons. Um, and the way that I think about a gauge is I want it to quickly tell me something, right? So to me, it's like a check engine light when I get in my car. I don't want six gauges on there because it's overwhelming for me as the user to look at six. I just want to know when one thing is wrong and a gauge doesn't allow you to do that. So dashboards really should almost be like your check engine light where when you get in, 
it's emphasizing that one thing, the check engine, it needs to be serviced. You don't want it to have every light on in your dashboard because then when that check engine only gets slightly brighter, like you might see in a gauge, you're not going to notice it or something might get missed that's critical. So that's where I would recommend use all neutral, which gauges don't give you a lot of options to do, and then only make the emphasis that check engine light so it draws your attention to that area. Um, but then you can start to use other stuff um, to help you guys get more leading indicators flagged rather than waiting for the lagging, which may indicate that something is in uh, the emphasis colors or it's in the red, if you will. So yeah, I would definitely say gauge charts should be used with extreme caution. That great tips. We have time for one more question uh, before we move over to uh, to um, uh, 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 Q&A session. So uh, last one here is when should you create 3D charts? 3D charts? Yes. Uh, so with those, uh, I would say that that would probably lend itself to more like GIS or some other modeling. Uh, again, I tend to stay away from those because if you're looking at it, and I apologize for not having any sample build up around that, but the bar graph, the way it's built can actually make you misread it on the axis. So I would encourage anybody that is interested in 3D uh, to go and build something really quickly inside of Excel and try to quickly look at the axis and be able to tell where it's at. Um, they're more of a, a look appeal rather than driving value, in my opinion. Again, when you start to talk about GIS or you start talking about spatial data, that's where you can get uh, value because you can see value, valleys inside of things. And um, I've worked a little bit with weather in my, my career. So looking at weather patterns can allow you to see the highs and lows of uh, a storm, and that can be valuable. So that's where I would maybe recommend it's based off the industry. But build it up and just see how it looks uh, if it works and it tells you what you need to then you, yeah you know go for it but i would tend to stay simple again use a bar graph without a 3d without shading without any of those bezels that are just going to make it look pretty it's not going to drive a lot of value to your user because again if you had three seconds or less to have that executive take something away you do not want that chance where they're going to misinterpret something because that's where they're going to leave it and you didn't tell your story correctly so um, again, I, I think it's more industry specific, but overall, I would stay away from those as well. So, so what you're saying is those uh, those uh, the 3D effects that uh, were introduced in Excel 97, you should probably avoid those, right? Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Thank you. Uh, so that's great. We are uh, we are out of time for this one. If anybody would like to ask some more questions to Rob, uh, have a little bit of a deeper discussion about uh, data visualization as practices, and join him over in uh, the Q and A session that we'll be having here very shortly. Uh, so thank you, Rob, and uh, we'll talk to you in a few. Awesome. Thank you, everybody.